Please welcome me to the stage. Thank you. Gladiators, you know. <laughs> My muscles are real. Very small, but they're real. Anyway, how is everyone? Good, that's very good. I'm glad to hear that. This is a bit big, isn't it? Bloody massive. Huh? It's far too big for my purposes, you know that? This place. I, mean, look, uh, I won't be going over there at all, you know that? <laughs> I've no business over here whatsoever. I'll just try it for a minute. <laughs> Not too bad, actually. It's all right. I wish, uh, I wish by the way, I could, I could um, use this space a little bit better. You know, because, like, most of the evening, I'll just be standing here really talking. You know, shite, probably. But uh, I, wish I, I wish I could dance, for example, but I can't dance. You know, and I, I can't. Honestly, God, no. <laughs> honestly, I would if I could. I will. I mean, maybe later on we'll all dance. If I, if you all dance, I fucking dance. All right, that's not the deal. No, but I mean, I can't dance because, like, all my friends and, and all my brothers and everyone I knew could all dance, and, and I just humiliate myself up and down the country every weekend, every Saturday night. You know, I feel like I'm a dancer trapped in the body of a tree. That's what I think. <laughs> that's the truth. And I've always wanted to dance. And a couple of years ago, I actually auditioned for a part in Riverdance. Right, remember the musical Tapping Extravaganza. Or a uh, big load of shite, as it's more often known. <laughs> and I was perfectly honest. I went along there and I explained the situation. I said, look, 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 you've got about 70 or 80 hoofers in your troop. Now, surely you can carry a few passengers. Come on, please. <laughs> I'll wear big furry slippers. You won't even know I'm there. Come on. <laughs> and I glue my arms to my sides. Come on, please. But flatly said no. Straight out, he said, no way. And he tried to electrocute me with his hair. <laughs> That's what he did. Mm. And then he tried to bite me with his big radioactive teeth. That's what he did. That man has far too much energy, hasn't he? He should be given sedatives and a thump. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say that to his face now. No way. I mean, I know he comes across as a sort of a, a, a fun-loving, sexaholic dance lord. But I'm sure he, you know, I'm sure he's every bit as quick with his hands as he is with his feet. Yeah. Isn't he? <laughs> probably. He'd be very good at undoing bras as well, probably. <laughs> An expert in that department. I think there's a part in every one of his shows during the performance where suddenly all the women in the audience realise their bras have been undone. <laughs> oh. And then they look up and they see flatly winking. Like, I'm Irish, and I'm proud to be Irish. And to this day, like, we've got the reputation for being a great literary nation. You know, you walk into any pub in Dublin, apparently it's full of writers and poets. Most of the countries, they're called drunks, not here. <laughs> no. Artists, we call them. That's right. We call them artists. And when we're not writing books, we're reading them. And I'm reading hundreds of books at the moment. I've got stacks of them beside the bed. I'm trying to read them all at once. And luckily for me, I'm a bit of a speed reader. In fact, I read so fast, sometimes I have to wear a helmet. Right? <laughs> And Sue Lawley stopped me one time. Do you know Sue Lawley? Another person I hate, actually. I hate her whole family as well, my dad. But she was asking me if I was ever stuck on a desert island, what two books would I bring with me? And I didn't like the threat implied in that question. <laughs> and I said to her, the first book I'd bring with me would be a big plastic inflatable book. Huh? <laughs> uh, and the second one would be how to make oars out of sand. All right? <laughs> Now leave me alone. <laughs> but I have, I have another ambition as well, apart from wanting to, to dance. I'd love to have my own chat show on television. That would be a huge ambition of mine. And to bring on as my first ever guest, uh, Mr. Neil Armstrong, right? And to keep him there for about 25 minutes on a big uncomfortable stool, a really tall one where he's, his legs are dangling over the top. And in the 25 minutes, I wouldn't mention the moon once. Right? <laughs> Honestly, God. That would amuse me now, a lot, that sort of thing. 
called me pathetic. But maybe towards the end of it all, I'd, I, I might sort of mention big heavy boots just to get him excited. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see his face. And the reason I do that is because I hate Neil Armstrong, right? And I hate the whole Armstrong family, actually. They're a share of big-headed bastards. The truth or no. They're always banging on, our Neil did this and our Neil did that. And our Neil has a lovely big helmet. Like, like we're all really impressed. So I probably won't get my own chat show either, to be honest. Perfectly honest. But I'd say, um, without a doubt, like, uh, I'd say I'd definitely get my own cookery show on television. I'd say everybody in this room would probably get one. I mean, you know, everybody who's anybody in the world has their own cookery show on TV at the moment. I mean, you can watch cookery shows from the moment you get up in the morning until the moment you go to sleep at night, which is the equivalent of a whole day, almost. <laughs> uh, yesterday, now I know this, because I, I, was, I was watching television and I had nothing else to do in the afternoon, and there was about 17 shows all about cookery, and there wasn't one single programme about doing the washing up. <laughs> uh, something seriously wrong there, in my opinion. That's irresponsible. And the biggest problem I have with these cookery shows is that all the recipes are for four people, aren't they? And let's face it, if you're watching cookery programs, you're cooking for one. <laughs> yeah. right. I think so. And like, the whole point of these cookery shows is they come on and they show you how to present your food in a lovely and appetizing way. And I don't need that sort of information. What I do is I just stick little bits of parsley to my glasses and everything looks lovely. <laughs> And so some people tell me that television influences people. I don't think it possibly could. I mean, if it did, we'd all be gourmet chefs by now. <laughs> and if you, instead, if you think of the people who actually watch the cookery programs, you've got the lame and the bedridden and Johnny No Pulse and his comatose friends. <laughs> They're all sprawled over the couch there with one hand on the remote control and the other hand down their trousers. <laughs> Aren't they? Oh, look at the telly going, oh, God, I'd love to make that. Oh, God, a cardigan of pork, my favourite. I'd love to have all my friends around and gobble that up. But uh, I don't have the right spoon, so I won't make it. I'll just dial a pizza instead. Only the phone is just beyond reach, so I won't do that either. It's, I'll just eat these pot noodles here in front of me. I'll rehydrate them with me dribbling. The thing about cookery shows is they don't really matter, they don't really influence people at all, because if you think of it, everyone's eating high-fibre breakfast cereals nowadays, aren't they? You know, every, I haven't fallen for this old fad yet, and I object strongly to the people coming on television every half an hour telling me things like, fact, there's as much fibre in one bowl of all bran as there is in a big field of carrots. <laughs> That's what they say. Or, fact, there's as much fibre in one bowl of all bran as there is in a big ship full of bananas. And why can't they tell the truth? Fact! There's as much fibre in one bowl of all bran as the toilet after eating a bowl of all bran. <laughs> I mean, whoever come up with that idea of putting a big heap of twigs in a cardboard box <laughs> and then having the cheek to call that food is a fucking genius. <laughs> it's outrageous. And most people nowadays, they're so obsessed with having regular and massive bowel movements. <laughs> you know, they want to spend half the day in the toilet. And I don't understand why they don't just throw a laxative tablet in a bowl of sugar smacks and enjoy themselves now and again. <laughs> Start the day with a smile on their face. And clean underpants for a change. That would improve the atmosphere at work no end. And like brand buds, they're not great, but they have some use, at least the brand buds. You, know, you use them as shotgun pellets. <laughs> and you can go out the back and shoot a pig and have a proper breakfast. <laughs> uh, don't, like, don't get me wrong, I didn't come here to complain at all about anything. <laughs> about anybody, except flatly. But I didn't really... <laughs> the more I think of that man. That show should have been called River Pants. <laughs> mm. um, ah, well, we're all on the same wavelength anyway. That's good. But, um, 
No, but I, I, I don't complain in general, like, to be honest with you. Um, because, obviously, being Irish, and it's not in my nature to complain, is it? <laughs> but generally, we wouldn't complain. Like, for example, if you've got hair, and you go into a barber's, and you get your hair cut, and the barber makes complete balls of it, and you have a big interview the next day, and he's dyed it red by mistake, or something like that. <laughs> and he says, how is that for you? You always go, ah, that's grand. Thanks very much. <laughs> no? No? Thanks very much. I particularly like the tuft there in the back, yeah? <laughs> It's a very nice touch. Uh, you don't complain. I like what I say if you're a, a vegetarian and you go into a restaurant and you ask for the vegetarian special and the waiter comes back with a big rare steak. You don't complain either. After all, you're secretly delighted. Why would you? Mm. Mm. See, none of the vegetarians in the audience complained. So it just proves my point, really, doesn't it? Probably didn't have the strength to. tried very hard, but... Oh, I don't agree with the man. <sighs> I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I'm not a complete savage or anything. Like, I've been trying to give up meat myself for years. But I can't, because I just love it too much. I can't even pass a field nowadays without running in and licking the cows. <laughs> Straight in there, any little gap in the hedge at all, I just... They enjoy it, I enjoy it. What's the problem? <laughs> well, what I was trying to say is, though, uh, generally, uh, 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 as a nation, we wouldn't really complain very much. And to give you another example, I was on an airplane one time, and I was going to New York, and uh, to look for work. It was about seven or eight years ago. And the air hostess came over to me, and she said, where are you from? And I said, I was Irish, you know, because it was true. I didn't want to mess her around. <laughs> and I have to be careful these days. And uh, she said to me, oh, you're Irish, are you? Well, you'd be needing this, so." and she left the drinks trolley down beside me. <laughs> like, I was furious, outraged by the stereotyping, but I didn't complain. <laughs> I didn't want to cause a fuss. So I went to America anyway, and I, got, I did get a great job over there um, on this big farm in the Midwest, uh, scratching cows. <laughs> I'm not making them, scratching them. You see, the farms in the Midwest are so big, you wouldn't find a fence or a post or a hedge for miles in any direction at all. And the cows get very itchy, you know, with the big flies and everything. So somebody had to scratch them. Yeah. Turned out to be me with all the experience I had from farms at home, scratching my arse. Yeah. I had the technology there in my hands, all the time. But I have a great job to fall back on now, if things go wrong. It's a uh, little business I, I set up a few years ago, uh, making stickers for the back windows of ships, right? <laughs> ship stickers. Like, uh, my other ship's the QE2. Uh, or the devil made me buy this ship. Or if you're close enough to read this sticker, then you're probably a fucking dolphin. Right? <laughs> Anyway, well, I can't help noticing, looking around this room, that some of you are wearing contact lenses. Right? You know who you are. And I don't understand why people do this. I mean, you spend so many hours every day putting them in and taking them out, like there's very little time left to see anything. You know? Waste the time. And I also see that some of you are wearing glasses. Now, there's no need to be ashamed. Like, like I wear glasses myself. You know, not in public, obviously. Right? <laughs> I've got my pride. But I think here's a bit of advice for short-sighted people in the audience, is that, that glasses on balance are much more practical than contact lenses. Like, especially if you're in an argument and you want to emphasize a point and you wear glasses. Very useful tool. All you have to do is... Now look here, George. And it's very effective. But it's not quite the same when you're wearing contact lenses. Where is he gone? <laughs> but of course, um, there are some advantages to wearing contact lenses. All is not lost. For example, you can uh, have different coloured eyes for different occasions. You know that? It's true. All you have to do is slice up jelly tots and put them in. <laughs> mm. 
just make sure to wipe the sugar off first. <laughs> or you'd have little kids running up and licking your eyeballs. <laughs> that doesn't do anybody any good now, does it? According to the manual. <laughs> of course, some people like to have red eyes uh, just before they have their photograph taken. <laughs> um, I've never, never understood why people do that. That's a mystery to me. Good. So they're useless. Of course, condoms are useless as well, aren't they? <laughs> condoms, they're useless and they're ineffective and they burst. And your stomach just can't cope with the sudden impact of two kilos of cocaine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, uh, you know, I'm not advocating uh, smuggling drugs, but the best way to smuggle drugs if you're going to do it is, of course, to shove them up a dog's arse. Not your own. <laughs> I just... Because if the sniffer dogs suspect anything, the airport. <laughs> oh, no. oh. You know, the officials will think they're just being frisky. They say, go ahead there, enjoy yourself. I'll smell the passengers on your behalf. <laughs> so that's foolproof. Unless, of course, your own dog wears sunglasses and sweats a lot. And that would give it all away. Like. <laughs> He'd be caught straight away. Inside. Remove all your clothing and your hair. But, um, very hard to know what to say now. <laughs> what do you say to a big room full of people? A big room full of strangers like you. I, I never know what to say to even one person when I meet them, first of a party or in the pub or on the street or at the zoo or wherever you meet people. And, like, for example, the first hurdle for me is the greeting. I mean, some people just say hello and they shake hands. And it's very acceptable all over the world. And some people, like, sometimes they, they, they squeeze your hand really tightly to show just how sincere they are as a person. And they almost break your hand sometimes, don't they? I don't know why they don't just get a hammer and go, how's it going? <laughs> and of course, some people go a bit further, like people you've never met, 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 met before, who can't speak at all. Rap artists, right? And they come along and they say hello to you and they try and kiss you on both cheeks. You know, they try and take advantage of you, like <laughs> catch you unawares. And that wouldn't be tolerated where I come from. You know, you just say, get off me, you, you bloody pervert, would you? <laughs> you European-style bastard, leave me alone. <laughs> Arr. Of course, some people go further again, they say hello and they try and give you a big hug. You know, the way things are going, it's only a matter of time before you meet a complete stranger who comes up to you and says hello and tries to fondle your testicles. <laughs> I hope. But it's very difficult to know what to say to people. And sometimes, I'm sure you've found this yourselves, you know, you'd end up at a, a party or something and you'd end up talking to somebody, you've just been introduced to them and you don't have a clue what to say. And it's really awkward. Very, very tense moment altogether. You just end up looking at each other sort of going... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, usually I just come clean because I can't stand the tension. And I just say to them, look, this has gone on long enough, right? Uh, I, I don't really have a clue what to say to you. And I can see by your face that you don't really have a clue what to say to me. And to be perfectly honest with you, I have enough friends. <laughs> you know, it's not even true. Like, you can never have enough friends in this life, but, you know, it gets you out of that little awkward hole at the time. And then you meet some people as well, and uh, you'd be talking to them, and they'd be talking to you, and the conversation's going fine, and the next thing, they spit all over your face. Right? <laughs> A big sort of glob of gob lands on your nose. It's awful, like, this person's just talking to you and spraying you, you know, as if they have a hose in their hand. There we go, just talking to you. And I hate them. And even more than those people, I hate the people who pretend they can't feel the spit landing on their face in the first place. And then a few minutes later, when they think nobody's looking, they pretend to scratch their forehead or something. Chicken curry, oh no. Filthy pig. And even more than them, I hate the people who don't bother talking to you at all. They just spit at you for no reason. <laughs> Plenty of them around. And then sometimes you'd end up at a party late at night. You might be in the kitchen and you'd have your elbow in the fridge. And you'd end up talking to the most boring person at the party. And all the time he's talking to you, you're desperately trying to hold in a yawn. You know, this kind of thing. You've, you've often been there. And you don't want to offend people by yawning in the face. So you, you hold it in for ages. Like, you'd hold it in for up to two hours. You know, you'd have locked jaw with the grimace. Um, and eventually you've no choice, you know, you just have to let it go. They won't stop talking. And you go... Oh. 
And then sometimes the spit goes right inside your mouth. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> and then, but I think the main reason why I was no good at ever talking to people, you know, it goes back to the childhood. I was always very shy when I was growing up. And uh, I used to go red very easily. I'd get embarrassed for absolutely no reason. My face would go bright red, especially talking to girls. And homeless people used to warm their hands on my head. I was like, you know, you know, there's the hot boy over there, come on. Yeah, it was like a big boil on a, on a red-haired builder's back. Right? But, and my face used to go so red sometimes that small animals would think it was sunset. And, you know, they'd fall asleep at my feet. An awful worry. And I couldn't get an erection for years either. Because any time I got remotely excited, all the blood would rush straight to my face with the embarrassment. <laughs> and I'd just collapse in a heap beside the animals. They have come for the sharp taste of Blackthorn. But you know, there comes a time in everyone's life when you have to stand up for yourself and you have to be assertive. And I read the books on assertiveness and I went to the courses, assertiveness training courses, and the good news is they really do work. Because I was on the way home on the bus one night from the course, and this old lady sat in beside me and she started talking to me. And I just turned around to her and I said, Shut up. <laughs> huh? I don't see where it says in your free pass you're entitled to a free chat as well. And then she stabbed me. Because you know? old people can be very assertive as well. That's the lesson I learned that day. And, um, but of course, I blame my parents for everything, you know. They were, you know, they were very strict. And uh, the, the reason I can't dance, for example, is because dancing was banned from my house. It just wasn't tolerated at all. You know, there was no singing or dancing or sudden movements whatsoever. <laughs> like adrenaline was even it was a banned substance in the house. My father would test us regularly for adrenaline levels. He's all right. Uh, and my parents had this motto when I was growing up. Uh, little children should neither be seen nor heard and preferably belong to another family. So, <laughs> off you go there for a while. Take the roller skates. But um, it was a very strict house and my mother, she had a terrible obsession with cleaning us all in behind the ears, right? I, this is always a ridiculous thing for me and I, I could never understand why she did this. And I would, you know, like I went up to her one time to complain on behalf of me and my neighbours and uh, <laughs> my ears. And I went up to her and I said, you know, what's the big deal? Look, it's the area of the body least looked at and least prone to infection, and you insist on using Brillo Pad and Ajax. Now, what's going on? <laughs> Mammy, as you're known around here. What? What's the matter with you? And she just turned to me and she said, Ugh. After all we've done for you, little man, and this is all the thanks we get. And our Lord Jesus died on the cross, and a big six inch nails pierced through his hands and his feet. And if I stuck this pin in you, you'd be whinging like a little goat, do you hear me? Like a little goat with massive fur and a wee tea towel over his horns. Last time I asked her any questions. Thanks very much. Well, she even went so far as to ban the book um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears from the house. Because a bit in that book where Goldilocks, she first of all gets into Daddy Bear's bed, and then the Mammy Bear's bed, and then the Baby Bear's bed. And it wasn't so much the bed hopping that my mother disapproved of, but it was a little hint of marital tension in the Bear family. <laughs> I wouldn't tolerate that at all, you know? And she didn't approve of the name Goldilocks either. She thought, Goldilocks, Goldilocks, that's a Protestant name. <laughs> like she brought religion into absolutely everything. If I was annoying my little brother, she'd be saying things like, well, Jesus didn't pinch his little brother. Well, you know, that's because Jesus didn't have a little brother. And if he did have a little brother, he would have done far worse things than pinch him. He'd be saying things to him like, you're going to burn in hell for all eternity. <laughs> and of course, I was brought up to be a Catholic, and I have no objection to that. And I have no memory of it either, thank God. <laughs> One thing I found uh, bizarre about the Catholic religion is the season of Lent. Uh, Forty days ends on Easter Sunday, and it corresponds to the time that Jesus spent fasting in the desert and encouraged to make a little sacrifice during Lent to show solidarity with our Lord, who's cold and hungry and sandy and all alone. 
And most major religions would have a period of sacrifice where they'd give up food completely and they'd nearly die of starvation. But not Catholics, because uh, we know how to look after ourselves. <laughs> what do we give up? Sweets. <laughs> yeah? I just ask somebody next year, hello Brendan, what are you giving up for Lent? Uh, crunchies. <laughs> no more crunchies for me for a whole month. <laughs> Bloody hypocrite. If he really wanted to make a sacrifice, he, sh he should give up something he really needs, like oxygen, for example. <laughs> and when I was going to school, all the kids in my class, they used to have their school books covered in wallpaper. And I know you did too, by the way, every one of you. Because every person in Ireland and in Britain and in Europe and in the Middle East and everywhere from the beginning of time has had their school books covered in wallpaper. <laughs> and nobody to this day knows why, do they? <laughs> it's a bloody mystery. You come home from school that first day and your mother gets tremendously excited. She goes, ooh, I think I know exactly what to do with them. <laughs> ah, yes. And she rips the wallpaper off the wall. There we go. That'll look far better in your school book than it will up there. Bloody mystery. And then you see parents on a Saturday afternoon in DIY shops all over the country going, ooh, what do you think of those stripes? Eh? They'd look lovely on his maths book, wouldn't they? Yeah. Very geometric. But my mother, she was very thrifty and she said she couldn't afford wallpaper. So she'd just splash a little bit of paint on them. <laughs> oh, put up shelves on the back for the apple. And little pictures of the Sacred Heart on the front. Oh. And one time she asked me that I want some trousers, and I said, I'd love some trousers. I'm seven years old and I'm fucking freezing. It's about time you asked me that I want some trousers. <laughs> and then she asked me what kind that I want, and I said, Wranglers, please, because they were in fashion at the time, and I was only seven, and I didn't know any better. And she ignored me completely. She went over to the man in the shop and just said, Give us a big pair of dingoes, please. <laughs> Come on, hurry up. Standard size, laughing stock trousers for the little man. Ones with enough extra corduroy on the legs to make a pair of curtains for all me lovely neighbours. And I want little sew-on patches of St. Anthony on the back pocket. I don't want me little man getting lost. It was always very embarrassing going shopping with your mother. Went shopping for shoes as well. I was going bright red beneath me balaclava at this stage and she... Like, she didn't want to know what my taste in footwear was. She just, she had a picture, a clear picture of what she wanted for me. Went in and just said, just give us a big pair of black shoes, please. Big, basic, functional, square, Eastern European type of shoes will do him. <laughs> Ones that he'd grow into by the time he's 47 if he's lucky. <laughs> With little razor blades in the heels, come on. <laughs> now you know what it was like. Well, I suppose um, the best thing about model airplanes is uh, watching. The best thing about model airplanes is watching your little brother's reaction when you smash them. <laughs> As my big brother used to say, um, before he drowned. <laughs> well, I was one of those very annoying little twits. He used to copy every single thing my big brother said. I'd be always imitating him. He'd come in after a hard day's work and he'd be furious and he'd be saying to me, now look here, you, just don't you copy me today, right? I'm not in the mood. I'd be going, <laughs> <laughs> now look here, you, just don't you copy me today, right? I'm not in the mood. <laughs> I thought I told you not to copy me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I told you not to copy me. <laughs> okay, that's it, I'm going to have to kill you. Okay, that's it, I'm going to tell Mammy. <laughs> I've known like that for years, but I, of course I shouldn't have teased him because he, he actually had a serious problem from an early age. A disease. He used to insult and abuse everybody he ever met. You know, strangers and friends alike. It was like one of those obsessive compulsive disorders that you'd see on Oprah on the, in the afternoon. And he brought shame in the family and we didn't know what to do with him for years and, and eventually we brought him to doctors and psychiatrists and butchers and everybody and <laughs> brought him in the boot of the car, but no, nobody could do anything for him. So eventually, as a last resort, we brought him to the acupuncturist. And they just arrived on the scene with a very good reputation. And we went in there, and uh, he started cursing and swearing at the acupuncturist immediately. Uh, like we never heard before. But she was having none of it. She went over to her cabinet and took out her biggest needle. And she stuck it in my brother's eye. 
that shut him up for a while. But then she stuck it in my eye. Because I've been copying everything he said. I came from a fairly big family too, you know, there was about 17 of us all together. 15 and two imaginary ones. But my father, by contrast, he was a great man for the crack, a great character. And uh, I remember one time, I was only about six years old, and I was, in, I was in the kitchen at home eating a bar of chocolate. And I took the price sticker off the bar of chocolate, and I stuck it on the fridge door. And when my father came into the room, I said, Dad, Dad, come here, look. The fridge only cost 12 pence. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, no, it didn't. <laughs> that fridge cost 400 pounds. So sorry about that, son. What a character, huh? Great man for that crack. Great man for the horses, too. He spent all his money on the horses. Got them whatever they wanted. Jewellery, saddles, fur, anything. And I admired him tremendously. And you know when kids admire their fathers, they always imitate them. You know, they'll walk the same way and talk the same way and do everything exactly the same. And I was no different. When I was only about six years old, I admired my father so much, I grew two huge big tufts of hair in my ears. He respected me for that. And he was a kind of a practical man too. I mean, one summer I was about 16 years old and I was up on top of this big electricity pylon quite near the house. It was a Sunday afternoon in the middle of summer, just after the big match. And I, I was up there for about two hours and I fell off. And I broke my arm and my leg and my ankle. And all I wanted to do at the time was to go home and cry. But my father made a very practical man and said, No, son, best thing for you to do is to get right back up in the pylon again. <laughs> And he banned chocolate from the house as well. As he used to say in his own words, chocolate is the devil's shite. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Not to leave it in a big basket outside the front door. And I didn't mind peanuts so much at all. Like sometimes uh, if we were very well behaved, as a special treat, he'd chop up peanuts very finely. And uh, when we were asleep, he'd lodge them between our teeth. <laughs> Lovely man. And uh, about once every year, you'd come in and say, now we're all going on family holidays. And we'd all go, well, hey, big day, big day. And we'd all get our buckets and spades and every single stripy thing in the house. And we'd all <laughs> pile into the back of the car. And we had a great time. And we'd play I Spy for about two hours. And then we'd punch each other a bit. And then we'd all pile out of the car and back into the house again. <laughs> we didn't go anywhere at all. That was during the oil crisis in the mid-70s. We had no petrol. And... We didn't mind at all, but we had a dog who didn't know anything about this at all. And it was a very unfortunate dog. Uh, it had no tongue, to be honest. No, it was one of those dogs going, Ooh. And we felt very sorry for the dog. So my mother, she'd stand beside the car with a hairdryer. So as when the dog would stick his head out the window, he wouldn't feel hard done by. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a great holiday. Oh. Oh. But, um, and then we did a petrol later on in the early 80s and we used to, my father used to take us on a Sunday drive, usually on a Monday night, like when there was less traffic. <laughs> but one of the things that annoyed me most about him, and there was many, it was the way he used to carry me around on his shoulders the whole time. I was very uncomfortable in the car in particular. So. I, I, I moved away eventually. I, I went to London about, about three or four years ago. I had to get away. And, and the main reason I moved to London, though, was because I was feeling very sorry for myself. I was very depressed. And I didn't want to be surrounded by happy people. So I thought that was the place for me. And uh, proved to be correct. And I was feeling very sorry for myself. Down in the dumps. And, uh, you know, I had a long face. I was feeling very depressed. And, you know, it was a big wrench leaving family and friends and even familiar enemies. It's all a big, big wrench. And I went along to a doctor uh, just after I signed on. Explain me problem. I said, I'm feeling very depressed, can you do something for me? And I half expected him to give me some Prozac or something like that. But he didn't. Do you know what he did? He just tickled me under the arms. Right? <laughs> Who's got the tickles? <laughs> and then he chased me around the room with a shaving brush. Come on, who's got the tickles? Hey! I'm going, doctor, doctor, stop it. works, you know, as well. That's the funny thing. 
What's the worst thing someone can say to you when you are feeling very sorry for yourself? And supposing you've been in, you're in hospital and you've just had a very serious operation and you've just lost your job while you're on the waiting list for the operation. <laughs> and you're feeling absolutely miserable. And what's the worst thing someone can say to you? No? Not bad though. You know, cheer up is another possibility. And I'll tell you the worst thing. You're lying in hospital, you're, you're, you, you, think you're, you think you're dying. And somebody comes in and says, here, I brought you a lovely bag of fruit. Right? <laughs> That's the worst thing, really. Seriously. I am speaking for myself, like, I hate fruit, right? I, I, I wouldn't eat fruit if I was healthy. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't eat fruit if I was a fucking fruit fly, to be honest with you. When I'm sick, I want magazines and chocolates and a massage. That's what I want. And I want to appeal to anybody here who works in a hospital, any nurses or doctors or anyone at all, if you ever see somebody coming in to visit a patient with a big bag of fruit, I want you to stop them in the corridor, please, and stick a syringe in their neck. And say, you're not getting out of here till you eat every bit of fruit in that bag. Every grape, every last bloody pip. All right? <laughs> Please do that. But, um, so I live in London now, and it's, oh, it's fantastic. I bought a new house there a couple of months ago, and I forget where. <laughs> what a waste of money. Hmm? <laughs> Should have got a map. Uh, I live in a flat now, and that's, that's fine. I know exactly where that is, thank God. I've got string. <laughs> hmm? But I actually, I feel very sorry for people who do own their own homes because uh, they, don't, they don't really enjoy the ownership. Now, th this is very true because when you, when you buy a house, right, it's a huge big expense, biggest purchase of your life, you, you get very preoccupied about the whole issue of home security and accumulating possessions and protecting them from burglars. And my father, he, he, was, he was, got very agitated about this because he'd been burgled too many times. And finally he came up with what he thought was the perfect solution. He, he just got a big sign and he put it over the front door of the house and just two words police station. Right? <laughs> so no trouble from burglars after that. A lot of people got beaten up in the kitchen, but no trouble from burglars. <laughs> mm. Mm. Thanks very much. I was always brought up to save money and be thrifty, like my parents. I mean, for example, they used to put a jellyfish in my bed every single night before I go to sleep, so I'd sleep on the edges and the mattress wouldn't sag and it would last longer. You know, that that's, the, that's the length they'd go to. I'm, so, I'm serious. And uh, I had a girlfriend one time, I, I think, and we used to go to, um, you can never be sure, and we used to go to a restaurant every once in a while. And I'd be trying to impress her. You know, I'd try and be sort of witty and cool and say the right things. And, not reveal too much of my personality. You know, <laughs> recite the alphabet backwards and that sort of thing. A bit of shadow puppetry as well. And, ah. Anyway, and uh, I'd also be uh, thinking of trying to think of ways of saving money as well when I was there. Uh, for example, she'd have a starter and I wouldn't bother myself. And uh, then we'd leave, right? <laughs> and on the way out, I'd take a big handful of mints and an extra coat. That was good value, I think I find. <laughs> Yeah. But, um, well, this whole, uh, whole love business is, uh, is very fickle altogether, isn't it? I mean, is there anyone here in love tonight? Yeah. No. Ah, no. no. Well, you two should get together, obviously. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, but love, as you know, anyone who is in love, it's very fickle, most fickle of all the emotions. I mean, to give you an example, I'm in love at the moment. I'm not anymore. See, very fickle altogether. It just, <laughs> no, it just comes and goes, you know? Like, there's no doubt about it, in my opinion, men are never happy with their circumstances. You would anyone agree with me there? They always want a little bit more. It's just human nature. You always think everybody else is having a much better time than you. Like if you're in the restaurant, you think oh, everyone else has much nicer food than me and much bigger portions. And they're having a much better chat down that end of the table than the one I'm having here with Flatley. You know, that's... <laughs> you know. I like the same things. Like, supposing for the sake of argument, you're a man, if you're not already a man out there. And you're in bed with a beautiful woman who loves you and who you love, which is very rare indeed. And you've been making passionate love for about four or five hours, which is even rarer, I think you'll find. <laughs> and she's still breathing, which is a bonus. And, uh, <laughs> and you're still awake, which is a miracle. I <laughs> suppose you have a big crate of Guinness beside the bed on this side of the bed here, and uh, all the hummus and pita bread you can eat on that side of the bed there. And you should be delighted with yourself. You have three or four of your favourite movies of all time and a video recorder and a pot of gold at the end of the bed and a football. You're, it's a dream come true. 
as a man, as a situation you've been idealizing ever since you were a little child. And you should put your hand in your heart and say, for the first time in my life, I I'm truly happy. <laughs> of course, you don't say that. You say, I wish there was two more girls here. <laughs> and a goat. <laughs> or is that just me? But, um, so I, I, we didn't get on well, me and my girlfriend at all, actually, for ages. Uh, like, she was one of these people who every single night before we went out, she'd always open the wardrobe and she'd start to cry. And she'd say, it's not fair, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> it was my own, my own fault, really. I suppose I shouldn't have hidden her clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to amuse yourself in some way, don't you? <laughs> I suppose so. And she was one of these people who used to talk to her car. And that was a terrible thing in my, in, my, in my book. That used to drive me crazy altogether, you know, talking to inanimate objects. You know, she'd spend more time talking to her car than she would to me. And it was a, she called it Dolly and she'd put a blanket in its bonnet on a cold day. And we'd be on the way to the pub and we'd stop off for petrol and she'd say, Oh, we're going for a drink and Dolly's going for a drink. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that kind of behaviour would drive you mad, wouldn't it? So I used to get her back. I used to talk to the fridge. In the morning I'd go down, Hello, Frank, any milk today? Hey. Talk to the Hoover as well. Well, Harry, are you feeling hungry, are you? <laughs> talk to the couch as well. Well, Colin, looks like me and you again tonight. <laughs> Talking to the iron as well. What are you looking at, you hot flat fuck, huh? <laughs> yeah, but you get very angry if you're in a relationship for a long time. And she was always picking me up on me, all my little faults as well. You know, always telling me not to leave me hair in the sink and not to believe in the grill on all night and little trivial nonsense like that. <laughs> you know, she'd be telling me to pick up the matches off the carpet after making the little roads in the farms and that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, and I'd be sitting there watching television on a Friday night about ten past eleven, because you know, I'd stay up quite late on a Friday. <laughs> oh, they were crazy days. And we, uh, she'd come in. I'd be sitting there, she'd come in and she'd go... Did you shit in your pants again, did you? <laughs> and she just couldn't let it pass, you know? Every little indiscretion. So no wonder we didn't get on so well. So we decided we'd better do something about this to salvage what was left of the relationship. And we went along to a sex counsellor, because one had just moved into the area, with diplomas and everything, and there was a special offer on Monday afternoons. And we had a voucher. And we went along there. And the sex counsellor said to us, the best thing to do would be to inject a little bit of humour into the sex life and to act out those fantasy roles that we only ever dreamed of. All right. So we got home and we had a cup of tea and my girlfriend decided she was going to be a Roman noblewoman and I was going to be her big slave. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she got me to clean the house from top to bottom. <laughs> including the atrium, and we didn't even have an atrium. And we didn't even have a house, and I didn't have a girlfriend, so it was all a load of shite. Sorry about that. <laughs> My mistake. Of course, a lot of people uh, I know now, they're getting married. Why, uh, why do people always marry the person they hate most? That, that's a mystery to me. Unfortunately, in Ireland, it's quite difficult to get married. You know, apparently you have to get a letter from every woman in the world saying you're not previously married to her. <laughs> and you have to live with a priest for a month. At least that's what Father Finnegan told me. <laughs> but um, I can understand why people get married, you know, because they're a bit lonely. And they just, somebody asked them and they get married. You know, you know, you marry me. Oh, all right. All right. All right. But, well, I don't understand why people have children. You know, speaking for myself, as I'm fully qualified to do, I have enough enemies at the moment without spawning more for the future. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah. I think people only have children for selfish reasons as well. You know, they want to uh, have them to help them make friends when they move into a new area. <laughs> or else they want a little slave, don't they? Here, you, come here, go to the shops, get me matches. Go on, clean out the attic there. Mow the lawn. Hit that kettle back into shape again. Knit a carpet for your little daddy. Come on, make those flapjacks you know we love. Come on, there's a power cut. Write a one-man play and perform it for us. Dance, monkey boy, dance. <laughs> But I, I, I don't mind, uh, by the way, why people, why children turn on their parents after a while, you know, when they get to about 15, they get very, you know, they get very upset. They suddenly realise how horrible their parents have been to them all the time, and they cover themselves in tattoos. 
and they come in and go, look at me now. <laughs> That's entirely your fault, all right? <laughs> no. And when you want to be rebellious a few years ago, you know, all you have to do is stick a little earring in your ear. And people would say, ah, you're cool enough. Come on, you can come to the party. Come on in here with your big extravagant trousers and do your modern dancing. Come on in here, Mr. Pop. No, and nowadays, it's not as easy at all to be rebellious. You need all your ears pierced 10 or 15 times. And your nose pierced and your eyebrows and your mouth and your belly button and your genitals and your liver and your feet and your bottom and everything, you know? Before anybody will give you the time of day. And there's some people out there who can't wait until the big skewer shoved up one end and out the other. And they're walking around like a big shish kebab, they won't be happy. Look at me, I'm king of the kebabs. Bring me gifts. And it's also a reason why so many people turn to drugs. In fact, I know the reason why so many people turn to drugs. And it goes back to childhood, it goes back to the playground. In fact, I blame swings, to be quite frank. I mean, just think about it. Cast your minds back. When you were about four years old and you get in a swing for the first time, and you don't even want to get on it straight away, you'd be thinking of any excuse not to get on it. You'd be saying to your father, no, father, I decline your kind offer of the go on the swing. Um, I'll, I'll sit on the wall over here. I, I've got crisp now. You, you push somebody else's child. That's all about it. And he's saying, just get up in the swing, will you, and stop wasting my time. Going, uh, no, father, I, uh, I'll stand my ground. And he's going, just get up in that swing, will you? We have to do something for the hour I have every two weeks. Now, come on, up there. <laughs> Hurry up. And eventually, um, you know, you give in. And you get in the swing, and after a while you think, well, it's not too bad. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And you'd be saying, push me faster, push me higher, old man. And wee, wee, wee. And soon you get bored with that. You're only ten, four, four years old, and you've only been on it a few minutes, and you're bored already. You want a bigger and better thrill. And you graduate to the fairground and the theme park, and you want to go on the roller coaster and the chair of planes. And soon that's not enough for you. You want more and more stimulation. Bigger and better thrills. So you start taking holidays in Beirut and doing whitewater rafting and... <laughs> bungee jumping and everything, and soon that's not enough. You still want more and more stimulation, bigger and better thrills. It's just human nature. And you start drinking and taking softer drugs and harder drugs, and before you know it, you're trying to staple your penis to the floor with a Black & Decker. <laughs> and you're just looking for the ultimate experience all the time. So next time any of your children ask for a go on the swings, just say no. Tell them, it's a, tell them it's a punishment for naughty children, all right? I don't know, but I'm not like that. I, I'm, I'm never looking for bigger and better thrills. Like, I, I wouldn't even bungee jump. I, I can't because I, I've got vertigo, as it happens, you know, so I can't. So sometimes I just stand on a chair and tie my leg to the chair with an elastic band and jump off, and it's just as good, really, you know. Ooh, ooh. Very good. But, um, uh, my expectations are quite low. Like, I didn't expect you to come here tonight, for example. You know, I, I expected completely different people, and... Um, <laughs> I expected firemen, mainly, over there, and people like that. But I, I didn't expect you to laugh, either. And thanks very much for laughing and, and smiling and chuckling. That's a great help. And um, I know different people like laugh in different ways. Some people just sort of smile politely. <laughs> you know, as if to say, I'm a little bit amused, but I don't want him to know about it. <laughs> and some people would have a good chuckle. And of course, some people, the best people, they laugh out really, really loud, and they do this as well. <laughs> and of course, some people don't laugh or smile or chuckle or anything. You know, they, they just sit there and stare for the whole evening. You know, they come to comedy shows for punishment, don't they? And I would say they're the very people who used to win staring matches at school when they were younger. Because they had such odd-shaped heads like no one could keep a straight face looking at them. You know? I don't know, some of them. But no, my expectations are low. Like, if, I were, if there was a wishing well there, that orchestra pit for the sake of argument, and I was to make a wish and throw uh, ten pence into the wishing well, I wouldn't wish for something really obvious like, you know, love or riches or cake or any of that stuff. I, uh, I just wish that nobody else's wishes come true. <laughs> that nearly always works. Sorry about that. Because you know, there's a saying where I come from, if you expect a kick in the balls and you get a slap in the face, then it's a victory. Right? <laughs> that's the reason why I am the way I am. Anyway, well that's about all I know and thanks very much for coming to the show and uh, I'll see you again sometime. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.